Okay. Um, is it still lagging is the question now. Is it still lagging? Add a host. Okay. Is, okay, so is the audio on this still lagging or are we all good now? Um, hopefully it's not, because I don't know why this Wi-Fi has worked for me before to do a live, so I'm not sure why it would be lagging today. But gosh darn it, I could go sit in my car and do it if this doesn't work. Not lagging? Yay. We're not lagging. Okay, I'm gonna try to, um, invite him again. There we go. Okay, so hopefully, yeah. okay, it's, they say it's not lagging now, so we're all good. Okay. Good. Yeah. So yeah. yeah the, let the, me the let me know if I'm lagging at all because my Wi Fi is not at all. Funny, so I bet it's me. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah. So the first step with food is to teach that neutral head away position because once you do that, then it just teaches them that pause moment, and then from there you can start to teach more stuff. Um, and it, and usually most horses pick it up in like a few attempts, like. I would say the ones that are the hardest to teach, the ones who've gone through really harsh training farms, because they don't know that they can make decisions to change their environment. And then it makes them more difficult to handle and like, well, not difficult, but difficult to teach. Like, hey, if you do this, this happens, because um, they've not been taught that they can actually do that. But yeah, that's the most simple way. And then I'd say the other main thing is just making sure horses are actually getting enough hay because if they're not eating enough, then they're going to be frantic around food time at any point. Um, right. Okay. Well, that's yeah. interesting. Um, I have another question for you. What do you think about imprint training? I don't like it. I actually did a paper on this for my behavior class. So this is a great question. Um, I think it depends on to what extent people take it. Like if you're following the whole training plan as like depicted by the guy who came up with the idea of imprint training, then absolutely not because it's very invasive. And I don't think that it actually facilitates in creating good horses in the future. And they've done studies on imprinted foals and compared them as like weanlings, yearlings, and then older and there hasn't been found to be a difference other than like in certain cases, imprint trained foals actually responded worse to certain things. So it depends on how far you take it. Cause I've heard people use it as a term for everything. And like where they take like one concept of this guy's training plan for imprint training and like call that imprint training when they really mean like, Hey, like we handled and like brushed the foal while he was young. And, but like the imprint training as written by the guy, like one of the, I forget his name. But one of the, the things written in his like training plan was like within 24 hours of birth, like practicing rectal exams, like putting like a rope around the cinch area of the baby to simulate a girth, covering it with a tarp. And it's like within like, yeah, just like literally a day of birth. And I was like, that is absurd. Um, like with to be that invasive, it's just not necessary. And like with a baby, if you throw that many things at them all at once, if anything, it's kind of teaching them like, hey, this is scary. There, there's 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 a lot to be especially when you're like only alive 24 hours imagine how much that would feel like when you've had no other experiences in your life um but like i i believe in handling foals but i don't okay. view it in print training like with my baby we handled him young from birth and he like to make i think i think it's important for them to be able to be handled and like be able to catch them lead them handle their feet because god forbid something happens and you need a vet out they need to be okay with people like my my got caught up in a fence and if he'd not been handled he would have killed himself because we wouldn't have been able to get him free safely um so i think it's important to handle them but i don't think i think the imprint training protocol is too invasive okay yeah, because I've found recently, you know, in, in my industry, I think it's pretty common to imprint train foals. Um, and I have a lot of, I actually have three bottle fed horses in my barn right now, which is, which is rare. Um, but I've always, I've found that all of my imprinted horses or the horses that have been kind of handled a lot when they're young, they, they tend not to respond as well to... Um, to cues and just being asked to do things like they're almost dulled from birth, you know? Um, and that's kind of something that I've found. Like it, I don't find that they're more scared, 
but I definitely find that they don't care as much what you're doing with them. You yeah. know, the, asking them to do things doesn't really compute very well with them. And so it's something that I've been thinking about recently. Um, you know, my personal horse, Malibu, is that Palomino that if you've watched my videos, you've seen her a lot. But she's an imprint trained horse. Um, I didn't have her as a baby. I bought her as a yearling. But I've noticed that she is extremely pushy compared to the rest of the horses in my barn. And I'm pretty much the only person that can actually effectively handle her. Um, otherwise she just walks all over people. Um, like she'll try and kind of eat you and like nibble on you. And there's just nothing you can do to make her kind of understand that that's not the right answer. Um, so that's what I've found about imprinted, imprinted or very excessively handled maybe young horses, um, is they just, they just don't respond as well when you come in and try to do your own things. It, it's almost like having to do a restart. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I get these horses and I'm like, huh, this is not how I expected you to be after being, you know, trained by somebody from a young age. Um, yeah. I, I hadn't heard, I haven't heard, heard about that from other people, but I could see how it would be because if you're handling them a lot, you're getting them used to a lot of pressure and stuff really young all at once, especially if they did the whole protocol where like that's quite invasive and then they might just their body stops reacting to stuff the same way because they've dealt with so much at a young age that they're kind of like eh. but yeah yeah I can send you the paper I did because it has the studies where they compared how the youngsters behaved and then you can see if there's similarities in that um so I can send you the link after this live if you want to read some of those because it covers the differences in more detail than I remember but yeah okay so I'm going to hit you with a little bit of a weird question here. Um, something that I notice a lot about your training is it's all about kind of having the horse um, to kind of think about things and, and try to do things on their own a little bit um, and figure things out. So I wanted to hit you with the first rule in my NRHA rule book, which is to rein a horse is not only to guide him, but to control his every movement. The mm -hmm. best reined horse shall be dictated to completely with little or no apparent resistance. And that's, that's the first rule in my rule book, you know? Yeah. Um, and so th my biggest question that I've been trying to reconcile is how do you not use <laughs> pressure and release, so to speak, to get that horse trained up to, to do basically whatever the hell you tell it to? I think that, uh, first of all, I would think that, like, as the horse rule changes, they would alter how that rule is worded a little bit, because I think that, here, just one second, I'm going to try to think of the way to word this. I think that there's beauty in an animal that does all the cues and wants to do what you do, where they're, like, jumping and, like, you know, jumping forward to do the cues and doing it on command and listening to you and being, like, controlled by you, doing so because they're, like yay, this is the best thing ever. I'm see like, think about like dogs that are trained for agility or like dog sports where the dogs are like, they're doing everything they're asked to do and they do it with like immediacy and precision. But a lot of those dogs are trained with like positive reinforcement. So they're doing it because they're just that jazz to get the ball or whatever the person has. And obviously with horses, that level of motivation might be harder to achieve with like the same immediacy, precision and obedience because we've bred it into dogs for a lot longer. But we've also normalized positive reinforcement with dogs for a lot longer and gotten to practice and use it with precision. So I think with horses, you could get the same thing. And I would think that even if you do that, and even if the horse is responding to the cues with immediacy and precision, I would personally rewrite that rule from a welfare perspective, just because I think wording it but with like dictating and controlling and like obeying the move it removes the context of like the partnership and fluidity with the horse and kind of makes it sound like it's like much more about the person, if that makes sense. Whereas like, and you can be doing the same thing in both concepts, but one of them is just more about like fluid partnership, happy horse, happy rider doing the pattern, doing it well, but less about like, Oh, if you can make your horse do this, we'll pin you well, because it should be, if you can make your horse do this happily and well, you should get pinned higher than someone who can make their horse do it, but their horse is pissed off and doesn't want to be there super shut down because you've done a better job motivating that to work with you. So you should get more marks, if that makes sense. Yeah, 
that does make sense. Um, and then I guess it just goes back to, well, that's just not the industry today. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, and so the other, the other thing that I was wondering is, you know, when you're training horses for English, you're having, you're having horses that you want them to seek out collection, right? They're, they're, they should be seeking out contact on the, correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't done English in like 10 years, but like not hiding from the contact, but like, you don't want them leaning on your hands, but you want like connection where if you like pick up contact, they're not going to keep like just tucking and tucking. Whereas with Western, since you're riding with really light aid, they probably would be soft to the point where if you tried to ride them with a consistent contact, they wouldn't feel into it the same way an English horse would. Right. So Sorry, you cut out for that last thing. I don't know what the last thing oh, oh, like. oh, Yeah, it's, it's definitely different because our horses, they don't lean on our hands per se, but you don't want them to hide from the contact where if you pick up a contact that they're just going to keep trying to avoid having contact on the reins. Okay. So then that leads to my next question, with which is, you know, when I'm training reining horses, the, the bit is almost a threat right like the 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 legs are the ones that come in and and teach the horses all the things they need to know like i come in and i squeeze my horses up with both my legs and that should tell them that they're supposed to pick their back up and lower their head and keep it off of the bit so when when i'm coming in and using my hand it's generally to say hey you didn't listen to my leg correctly now i'm going to pick you up and hold you back here to show you where i want your head and then I'm going to release once you leave it there and don't try to fight the bit again. So how would you do something like, like that, like with positive reinforcement, where I don't want my horse looking for a bit, I don't want my horse to really want to feel that bit, so to speak? So with my youngster, actually, the way I've taught him, like with a horse, they'd be built him so they'd go about it differently but I've taught him how to like maintain a natural stretchy posture just from following a target and it's kind of become a default posture we're doing liberty work even if I don't have the target stick for him to follow and it's allowed him to develop like a nice offline and learn how to carry himself and start to develop the muscle he needs ridden so with something like that under saddle I'd train the behavior the same way where you'd have it like if your legs are the main cue you'd teach them to cue it to that but if you're teaching it from the ground first you'd probably connect it to like a vocal cue other type of tactile cue first and then transition that cue to a leg cue once they are going under saddle and then that way you're not like their association with the bit would kind of just be like in connection to everything else if that makes sense where like the bit is just there as an aid and they've not really been taught the bit does anything other than teach them to like move sideways and stuff so like i target for a lot of stuff like when I'm teaching traditional cues under saddle to a horse I find it actually easier to get someone on the ground because then all I'm doing is using the target to influence the movement I'm aiding and they're connecting the rain so I'm still doing the same thing but instead of increasing pressure until they turn they're motivated to turn for the target already and my rain aid is just being connected to that and then that's how they start to associate their turning aids is like oh, I always feel this left turn aid towards the target left. And then soon they'll start turning with just that aid without the target. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. What, what are your thoughts on spurs? I, like, I've used them in the past. Like, it, like I used them a lot when I was showing arrangements and whatnot. I think a lot of people massively misuse them. And I think a lot of the time they're dulling horses more than they do anything else. Um, if people can truly use them with like a soft leg, they're not my biggest bone to pick because I also understand that Western horses are like spur trained and trained differently. But I have seen like a lot of abuse done with spurs and I think that they're overused to basically um, cause enough pressure to make like a horse who's probably backed off from discomfort, other underlying thing, be motivated to move forward a lot of times. Like in the English world, too, like the horses will have like, really harsh bits and they'll be going into the jump ring and they'll be trying to run away from the leg, but they're getting caught in, in the bridle with how hard it is and like constantly getting their mouth reefed off and then being spurred again. And then it's like, they're trapped in like this window of crappiness and that's where I don't agree with it. But I, I think that like not everyone abuses them. I think in a perfect world, if we could motivate horses well enough to want to train, offer cues, 
like that without needing anything else extra. But it's not a hill I'm going to die on um, is like attack numbers. Okay. Yeah, because I've, you know, I've obviously heard different things about Spurs throughout the years. But I think the thing that I really like about them is the precision that they offer. Um, you know, um, you can see my Spurs. What are they? They're there. Um, what I what I kind of love about these Spurs is they're actually really dull. Like the rowels on them are quite dull. Like I'm not going to be stabbing my horse and drawing blood or anything. But they, I love the long shank on them because it just allows me to like touch a horse at the back of their rib cage and like the one spot that their muscles aren't tense. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, when we're working horses for the spins, for instance, like that's, for me, that's the hardest maneuver in reining is getting those horses to spin at, you know, 30 miles an hour around one inside hind pivot, but that's stuck to the ground. And like when I, if I do that without spurs, I feel I don't have the precision in my legs to, to tell that horse, nope, this part is not doing what it's supposed to do. Pick that rib cage up there, move that over here move my foot forward to get the shoulders to go faster and it's almost like the spurs are like the icing on top so to speak you know i start all my horses barefoot unless they're really really sluggish Mm -hmm. Um, but what what do you think about like using spurs for i guess driving horses versus like the precision that that i feel like they offer that you just can't get from a barefoot in my mind I feel like people that use spurs how you would be wouldn't be part of the biggest problem with them because you're using them as like to refine an aid that's been taught and it's just like yeah to further refine the horse rather than kind of weaponize them in an attempt to like cause pressure to make the horse go more forward. So I think that wouldn't be the issue with it at all. Like I think that I think the biggest problem with the horse world which I guess would be my problem with spurs is I don't like the fact that in the show world it's more Normalized to use an aid that is inherently harsher in the sense that if someone uses it poorly it can cause much more damage than let's say like let's say like if I wanted to ride into the arena with like a target stick and wanted to target my horse's hip to move it over or something so it's okay it's okay for people to use spurs but we're not allowed for the same open mind towards things that are harder to abuse and softer to use so I think that's where the like that's where people have a bone to pick with spurs and other stuff like that I think because there's discrimination on the other side to that that doesn't allow people the same opportunity if they want to use different tools than that um so I think that like spurs can be fine when used in like like someone like you is using them for refinement but a lot of and like less experienced people like for example like people doing barrel racing who are kicking the crap out of the horses with the same spurs as you they're using them for violence and that's what gives the tool a bad name is those types of people right okay well cool do you have any questions for me i guess um like i i would say like i i think that like i i think that it, like correct me if I'm wrong but you seem like you, for how you use like pressure and release it's not about like e- escalating the pressure and getting really loud and scaring the horse when they don't respond like how would you typically like like look at teaching basic skills like tying or like halter training and like what does that look like in your program tying that's a good one um generally I'm going to start by ground tying my horses. Um, I want them to just understand that whenever I leave them and I show them the rope, like when I teach my horses to ground tie, I take the lead rope off of their neck and I show it to them. I put it like right in front of their eye and kind of wave it there. And then I drop it from right in front of their eye. And then I use a vocal cue. Usually stand is my favorite cue. And I'll just tell them stand. And once I have a horse that when they when they stand and I walk away and I can walk circles around them both ways and stuff like that, that's when I'm going to go ahead and start kind of tying them up. Um, I generally don't start tying horses very young because I don't really see much point to it most of the time you can do what you need to get done on a horse that's ground tied pretty well if they're good at ground tying um but you know once they start tying honestly i've never really had a problem with having my horses tied up once they understand how to ground tie they're just being tied up to something and if they take a step away they just kind of go oh okay i guess i can't go anywhere 
Um, you know, I, it's not something that I guess I've ever had a problem with. You know, I've, I've not the kind that, no, I'm not going to hard tie my horse to a wall and leave it for three hours. I don't see that that really does anything for my horse. Yeah. Um, but honestly, you know, the thing is, I don't have any horses that I've really had to, like, fix how they tie. Um, you know, I've had one horse that, like, pulled back pretty severely um, that came in to, like, work with me and... You know, the first thing that I kind of do with those pullback courses is just drape the rope over whatever I'm tying them to and start feeding um, their hay there. You know, like I'll just put a hay bag up while they're tied, not actually tied. Um, but, you know, if I really need to, this is probably where you're going to hate me, but this is, you know, if I really need to fix it, the the one that I was taught and that I had used on that particular horse is where you take a rope and you put it around their cinch area and then you run that up and to the halter so that when they pull, they're not actually pulling on their neck or on their head anywhere. They're pulling on their own rib cage and pulling themselves back forward. And once she did that, I think twice, I just kind of went ahead and took that off of her and then tied her up. And she hasn't had a problem with tying since then. But I think in that case, I kind of used a mix of positive reinforcement with my hay bag and you know just draping the rope there and showing that's where I want her but it, she was one as soon as you actually tied the knot she just set back yeah like she wouldn't wait like you could drape it there you could loop it and she'd be fine but as soon as it was tied and she touched and realized it wasn't going to give she just set back yeah. instantly and so for her I just the only thing I could really think of was to use the belly rope and run that up and you know it worked well for her but I don't know what your thoughts on that are. My concern with the belly rope is like it's better than them pulling on their neck for sure but there's still a lot of like nerve endings and important areas on, along the sternum so if they're putting weight there it's also not ideal and they could compress nerves that cause the body harder for them to get a breath in and whatnot so with a horse like that like I've had ones that pull back really really bad because I've had horses come in specifically to fix tying because they're a liability liability um right. and like what I would do for something like that probably is if it's the knot like if it's specifically a knot or like feeling like the pressure on the rope that makes the horse scared I would start working on how they give to pressure and like I I usually do it by running the rope through the loop and then holding the end so that that it's tight um, but if she would kind of see that it's not tied like that, I would probably do it by pretending to tie a knot. And then when they start to set back, I'd probably start it up by just like letting, like letting her take a couple steps back. And then once she stops, I would want to start clicking and rewarding that behavior because then it takes like it's the feeling of feeling being trapped and the pullback response is the flight response for a horse is like a normal evolution response to being trapped. So it is a behavior that's not ideal but for her she's probably not like actually registering the fact like I'm tied it's fine like it's safe now I bet that horse somewhere along the way probably had a really traumatic pulling back incident and then it's kind of like PTSD where you're having like flashbacks where like the, the knot would be the thing that connects it to their previously bad experience and when they're going through like that reminder and generalizing those things it's like the it's like it's currently happening so she'd like pulled back and flipped over and like got like cast or something or had some traumatic incident it would be like she's basically back in that incident so I try to bring them out of that by like giving agency to be like oh I'm free I'm not trapped and then slowly conditioning it to like not having it be a like snap I'm scared now response when they feel like that extra pressure um because unfortunately like ju just like a lot of horses that have severe issues like that if you find like someone closer to the source of when it started to happen there's some insane stuff that people do to horses that like you couldn't even imagine. And then you hear about it happening and you're like, holy cow, I can't believe this horse is not worse. I had no idea that anyone would even consider doing that to a horse. It happened a few times where I've heard stuff like that. Like I found out uh, I knew a horse that halter broke by someone putting like a nylon rope halter and then tying it to the back of their ATV as a weanling and literally just taking off and like, dragging it behind them and I was like oh my god and the horse had like a lot of neck tension and didn't want to relax at the pole and I was like well no wonder now like I wouldn't yeah 
Yeah. That's I've heard of that method too. Um, of course, you know, there's there's rednecks everywhere. Um, but you know, it's yeah, I totally agree that that, you know, a lot of horses come from, you know, experiences that we don't know. It's just like people, you know, everybody's got their own baggage that we don't understand. Um but yeah, that mare, she was just so overall that mare was just pushy. Mm-hmm. Um, she's the one, if you've looked through my videos, I think it's probably my second most watched video. I was teaching her to load in a trailer. Um, and it got controversial cause I tapped her with the lead rope to drive her away from me. Um, what do you think about, like, I'm sure you're not in favor, but like I use, you know, like the end of my lead rope or something like I like to start and kind of do the ask, ask, tell, demand, or like whatever you want to call it, uh, hair, skin, muscle, bone is another way people have mentioned that. Um, and it's, you know, that's really typical pressure and release training. Um, you step the pressure up till you get what you want from yeah. them. Um, but I don't know, I try and do it a little bit differently, I guess, where I start with a cue and I want my horse to understand like a cue for their pressure. So I'd like to use a point cue. You know, if I point at my horse's hip, they should move their hip away from me. If I point at their rib cage, they should side pass. If I point at their shoulder, they should move their shoulder. So with that mare in the trailer, I kind of pointed at her hip. She swung it towards me still. And then I put my finger into her because she kind of ran into it. And then when she still didn't get off my finger, I just grabbed the end of my rope and just kind of tapped her once or twice on the hip. And then when she stepped away, I just pet her and let her stand there. And, you know, that's pretty typical pressure and release, but I don't know, for me, it like, it worked really well. And she stood in that trailer quietly. She's been home with her owner for, you know, four or five months since then, and they've never had any problems in the trailer. And what her owner was kind of telling me is that she thinks that she learned that she could just crush her owner up against there because her owner couldn't get her off of her. What, what do you think about like, using let's using pressure and release in a situation like that you know i know that we're different there but if you get like like if you're getting trapped like honestly if i'm pinned against a wall and a horse could keep moving like i'll even like use my elbow to try them off because it's like at that point if they keep moving towards you they can literally crush your rib cage if you're against the trailer like it's not safe so like do what you have to do to get them off of you but i wouldn't view a situation like that as a training situation because you're in a situation where you're like I need to not be here because it's not safe like I could get kicked in the head I could get squished against this wall I need to get the horse off of me so if you're like pushing them and you're not moving and then you need to get them off of you it's like do what you got to do in that sense to get them away from you for safety I would try to escalate it as little as possible because if you get too loud some horses might fire out at you and get worse but like yeah like I I don't know I would say do what you have to do to get out of the situation because here we had This is a different situation because the horse was sedated, but a vet in our area became like paralyzed from the neck down because of a horse falling on him and pinning him against a wall. So situations like that, I don't, I'm like, get, do what you got to do to get the horse away from you. That's that. But with, with regular training, um, with the trailer, I don't use a ton of pressure because the trailer for, for most horses, the fear behavior, everything that they're doing is due to fear of the trailer. So I try to do confidence building stuff and the way I teach them to like seek things is by like driving them forward by like getting them to follow the target or like driving them forward by sheer motivation to be in the trailer because my goal is to make there such an awesome place to be that if you were to like turn them loose in an arena and just leave them they'd walk into the um, with themselves. Okay so now I'll, I'll bring up the name that everybody wants to talk about Clinton Anderson. Um, you know, he, his trailering method or loading method is, I guess, hate to say it to you, but somewhat similar to what I do. Um, in that, you know, if we've got one that doesn't want to get on the trailer, we're going to kind of lunge them outside the trailer. And I use like the really turn their head away from the trailer, disengage their hips, make them back up, stuff like that. Then turn them towards the trailer and like, let them stand there. You know, and once they start to stand at the trailer and try to put feet into the trailer and stuff like that, you know, reward them, pet them, tell them that they're good. And then I like to release the pressure. This is where I get a little different. Once my horse takes a step or two into the trailer, I'm going to pet them in there and then tell them that they did a good job, that that's all they needed to do for now and then take them out. 
walk and lap and then put them back in. And if they take a step further than they did before, then I'm going to reward them even more. If they don't go as far as they did before, then I'm going to take them away from the trailer, turn them away from it and make them go back to work and move their feet. And, you know, to me, that seems pretty Anderson-esque, you know, work their feet away from what it is you want them to be away from and then, you know, make them be calm when they're where you want them. What what do you think about doing stuff like that? If it's, you know, maybe it's almost toned down, so to speak, but, you know, trying to combine the two of them like that. I would say your method would be inherently less stressful because you're giving the horses a break and like retreating from the thing that's causing them fear after they do a good attempt. So your method would cause less stress than his because you're not just amping up the pressure until they give you like the full duration of the behavior, which would be getting all the way into the trailer. So yours would be work probably more effectively overall than his on more horses because you're helping them reduce the stress before taking them back. I would still do it differently personally because like I think that like my opinion on Clinton Anderson is that like the reason why he primarily works with like quarter horses and stock horses is because his methods if used on like a hot-blooded thoroughbred and like arabians and stuff it wouldn't be successful as on on as many horses you'd run into a lot of problems because those horses would literally kill themselves rather than be forced into a situation that in their heads will also kill them like they would be flipping themselves over onto pavement you'd be getting like shattered withers broken legs or you'd be getting a horse that like you get it in the trailer but as soon as you try to unload it it's firing out and trying to run people over and just getting more and more dangerous because now you've basically put like a wild jungle cat into a little crate and then you're trying to get it out after so I don't, I don't use those methods because to me, it just makes like, it might work on some horses that are more dull and don't get as upset and anxious and kind of revert to themselves more when they're nervous. But the ones that outwardly show their anxiety, like they become so dangerous that I don't want to be in a trailer with them because they'll run you down and like pin you against the wall in the trailer. And then no matter what you do to try to increase distance, it's really hard to get a horse off of you in a trailer and it's dangerous to unload them. And if you ever get in a trailering accident, they're more dangerous. So I try to work on it by like lowering the fear of the trailer itself. And it's worked really successfully for me, even when I've gotten in horses that are really dangerous um to load in the trailer and like I've done it at Liberty too and it's worked and like I used to have very much the same mindset where I was like you can't like you you have to use some level of pressure and make it hard and I would kind of view horses stubbornness to load as like their unwillingness to do what I asked rather than a fear thing and then when I started to shift I realized how much faster I was getting the job done with less physical output on my behalf because it only required me to just basically stand at the edge of the trailer and point and that's it and easy yeah Yeah. okay so yeah i use a similar thing you know on my broke horses i stand at the end of the trailer and point and they jump in but that's from you know having driven them forward i guess using pressure so Mm -hmm. they're under the understanding that if i point with this finger the other finger the other hand is there to use like the lead rope or i don't generally use a stick and string mostly because i'm too lazy to find it um but you know to drive my horse forward with that other hand if they kind of stop and that's you know for my horses that's how they understand the pressure and release of you know jump in the trailer follow my finger go into the trailer otherwise i'm going to use my hand and kind of drive you forward into there um so yeah definitely different but i definitely have taken some things from from you and other positive reinforcement people when it comes to trailer loading because you know, it used to be, and it still is one of my least favorite things to train a horse to do. Um, and I think it's getting better because, you know, it's not so much of a, it used to, I used to think of it as like an ultimatum. If they don't get on the trailer all the way, like I have failed, you know, like I did not win this battle and it's, it's being able to like, look at it from a different perspective of being like, Hey, we're both trying to win this battle. And we just need to, you know, get this horse more comfortable in the space. So I'm appreciative to TikTok, really, for showing me that um, and, you know, kind of changing up like the the way that I'm kind of teaching my horses to load. But anyways, I feel like I've asked you a lot of questions. Do you have anything you wanted to talk to me about? Yeah, I do it the trailer loading stuff. I already said how you do it. And I find that interesting. And what you said about like you and trying to win the battle and then changing your perspective. I love that because. it's a perspective change I think most horse people have to go through because we view it as like 
you versus the horse a lot of times when it's actually like you and the horse versus the problem, which in this case would be the trailer. And horses are so much different than other animals because we're trying to motivate like an animal that is notoriously scared of everything to do stuff for us. So it's a lot harder. And I, I like I, I appreciate how open minded you are to trying new things because a lot of people aren't. We, We've traditionally used horses as work horses and th- like that's where you have like there's never there's not an option it's like you have to do this and it's been that way for a long time We've not actually had to learn how to motivate them to do what we want them to do but I think that the more people start to experiment and try with that it's probably going to be pretty cool the things we discover we can do with horses if we've already been able to accomplish as much as we have through like prim- primarily fear-based methods because um I don't like the difference I see in my horse's trailer. Like, like you said, it's your least favorite thing to train. It used to be mine. It's now one of my favorites um, because I don't teach it in a way anymore where I have to go in with the horse every time or where they're getting in, where they're so scared that they're going to run into me. I like, I've gotten pinned up against the trailer so many times from dangerous horses. And like, that's why I hated it. And now that I've changed how I do things, I love it because I get to be safe and then I get to have horses that are easier to load. Like when I, when I was trailing my youngster lots, it got to the point where when we opened the door, we would literally have to hold him back from loading because he would be that eager to load in the trailer, try to load, but we were ready to have him. load, And it made, it saved me so much time. And yeah, I, I just think it's cool that you're open-minded enough to discuss this stuff because also like, um, like I, I, not saying that this is you, but a lot of like men in your position where they're running training barns and are successful in the horse world, they're very disrespectful to people like me, no matter like, it doesn't matter how experienced, like I've seen people do it to another lady on here who's a behaviorist and she has her master's um, in behavioral science and she'll have people disrespect her who are running training programs and say that she's wrong and like that she's stupid and stuff and like I don't know if you've noticed like any sexism in the horse world towards like any female trainers you might know but it's definitely a factor um that I have to consider in training that I've noticed for sure like what I say on TikTok and anywhere gets questioned way more than I see anything put out by male trainers um and I don't think like if I tried to train and market myself how Clinton Anderson does I don't think it would be received well at all like other than by like other women and people who aren't sexist but it, overall it would be like i'd be received as more aggressive um assertive like bitchy <clears throat> blunt. um and like have you noticed any of that like as a man like uh, you you might not because it's not going to be directed at you but is that something you've noticed at all online for sure um yeah i i think you're definitely gonna see that i mean in the horse world like you do in any other industry right it's um the the thing that i think is unique about the horse world that that leads to that so to speak is that for whatever reason 99 percent of the clients are female and 99 percent of the head trainers out there are male yeah um it's something that i have always as a kid like i grew up showing 4-h as a kid I grew up showing horses in the NRHA as a kid. I was the only guy, you know, like, what's that? Where do all the guys come from? Exactly. That was what I always wondered. Like growing up, I was like, where, where do all the male trainers like come from? Because there aren't nearly as many female trainers in, in the industry than there are males, but it's a female dominant industry. You know, there's, there's no way there's, there's just no two ways around it. It's mostly women showing horses or doing horses in general, but all of the training barns are run by men and it confuses me. It always has. I don't know if you have any insight on that, but I also think that that is part of why there is that sort of like inherent sexism in the industry is like a lot of people are going to view women as non pros. And they're going to be like, oh, yeah, you're a non-pro, you know, oh, you're a horse girl, you know, that's, yeah. that's, you know, and like, I'm a horse girl too, you know, like I grew up with the Briar horses and like, I, you know, came from a family that had nothing to do with horses. And so I think that that's where 
you know, having got my start going through a similar program to a lot of perhaps the women that become trainers, the, the few that do, um, I guess I have a little bit more of a unique perspective. I don't come from like a, my dad trained horses, my grandfather trained horses, everybody in my family trains horses. So I train horses, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that sort of mentality maybe lends itself to be a little bit cl more closed minded. I think, um, uh, for sure. You know, when it's like when it's like the family industry, you've got like your family like secret recipe for how you train horses and stuff. And I'm just I just pick things up where I can. You know, it's like I've learned from so many people, women and men throughout my whole show career. And, you know, my first trainer was a woman and my second trainer was a man. My 4-H leader was a woman and she's probably the most intelligent and well-versed horse person I've ever met. Um, you know, she was 82 leading our 4-H club. She'd been a steward at the USEF for 45 years. You know, it's one of those when you're surrounded by strong women in the industry, you have a lot less willingness to dismiss them. Um, and I think, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's a bias that comes from, you know, who are you surrounded by? Yeah. Um, you know, if you're surrounded by a bunch of, you know, women that bought horses to take them home and feed them cookies then like, sure, I guess that you have more of a tendency to be sexist. Whereas, you know, if you come from a background where women taught you just as much, if not more than men did, then, you know, you're just not going to have that as much. That's my stance on it. I don't know. No, I believe that because I think also like anyone, even if you're a woman, if you come from like a horsey family who has already proven themselves, you kind of come into the horse world not having to prove yourself as much because everyone just expects you to be as good as your family name. And mm -hmm. with that, you kind of can get a lot of handouts with certain things that can give you a complex if you allow it to. Um, and like coming from like grassroots, like you have without like having a horsey family and having to pick up stuff as you learn and like ride without any help from like parents or anything, you, ha you're, you have to be more open to different opinions because you have to listen to them and you're trying to pick up as much as you can. Um, and you're definitely much more humble than a lot. Of, like, yeah, like, especially like if we were to compare you to Clinton Anderson, like that type of trainer, like much more. And like, I, I would say you're like, like more like a Warwick Schiller type because you're open-minded to trying different things. And the way you speak to people is much more respectful than I've known. Like, I've noticed a lot of trainers, including women, are really disrespectful to clients and other people. Um, and, like, especially clients who have money, like you said, and are buying horses just to bring them home and feed them. And they have, they, they might get a really nice horse, but they're just, a, they're a pleasure rider or, like, an amateur. Like, they get disrespected a lot from trainers, men and women. And I don't know. I, I, I like the trainers that just take on a more respectful tone to, like, people and horses. I've noticed it's all connected, like your willingness to trade clients and blame things on clients and horses issues on clients kind of crosses over to the willingness to blame. Horse. Yeah. I mean, to me, it doesn't make any sense. Like they pay your bills, <laughs> you know, whether or not you agree with your clients or not is beside the point. It's your job to teach them and teach their horse as best you can, you know, and if they're not somebody that's willing to learn from you, they'll they'll eventually drop out of your program. You don't need to be like, hey, you're stupid. You know, it, to me, yeah. it's just like, there's no point. These people pay my bills. You know, they, they are the ones that allow me to do what I love. You know, I wouldn't be able to be a horse trainer without tons of insane clients. You know, I have, I have clients that I think are crazy, but I love them. They're great people. And they're, you know, we're all just out here trying our best. Yeah. You know, and... I just don't think that there's any reason to like, you know, disrespect your clients and tell them that they don't know what they're doing. They know that they don't know what they're doing. That's why they called you, you know? And I think that that, that shift in the industry kind of needs to happen and it's starting to happen. Um, you know, where the clients, the clients are the ones that make this industry go around. It's not me and you, it's the people that, you know, get horses and send them to us. It's, it's kind of strange to me. It, it's, it's that gatekeeping thing, you know, it's like, Oh yeah, you just bought your first horse. I've been riding horses since I was knee high on a grasshopper, 
you know, and it's like, sure, you have, but they enjoy the industry just as much as you do. I was actually just talking to another trainer, a Western Pleasure trainer the other day, and we were like, the thing about this industry is it's such a stupid thing to do. Like, we just decided to pull out some outdated form of transportation, train it, and ride it around in circles for fun. Like, if you aren't out here having a good time, like, why are you doing this? There's no necessity to it. Like, you should be out here enjoying yourself. You should enjoy your clients and enjoy the people that you work with. Otherwise, like, go sell insurance. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like that pays a hell of a lot better. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the thing for me. It's like, why, why would you make this a miserable process? Everybody's doing it for the same reason, because we like horses yeah. and we want to have fun. Um, and so that's, that's just kind of how I approach it. It's like, we're all out here to have some fun and we all need to be well aware that what we do is ridiculous, you know? It's <laughs> a good way of it. I think that for some people, a motivation to be in the horse world, especially as a trainer is like the amount of control you can establish in a barn, like over horses and clients. It's like their version of being like a politician or something or a police yeah and being able to just control their environment in like this little setting and and in a what much more toxic way than you'd be allowed to in regular society so i think it almost come becomes like a game of sims or like a human experiment where people are like i don't have enough control in other aspects of my life so i have horses so that i can control them and clients too yeah i totally see that um you know i used to i used to call well, say that, you know, the industry has what I call banner trainers. You know, their only goal is to go out to the big shows and have a banner with their name on it on the front of their stalls and have 15 horses packed back there. It, they don't care, you know, necessarily that they're doing the best by their horses or their clients. They just like having their name on a banner. That's what I used to call them. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I totally understand where you're coming from there. Yeah. So the other thing that I wanted to ask, like in like in your experience like as a trainer have you noticed like that there's a large volume of trainers in your industry that have clients that they'll kind of take advantage of by like encouraging them to spend way more money than they need to or like buying horses that the client can't ride but that are fancy for the trainer to show and like futurities and stuff yeah a hundred and ten percent yeah all the time oh. um you know the the money that's the other thing that, in my opinion, is a shame about my industry, but I love reining horses, so I keep doing it. The biggest money you can earn is their three-year-old year. That's the futurity, you know, and that's not how it was set up to be. It was set up that the futurity is a showcase of future talent, you know, and that's just when the money came in. And, you know, when you can win $500,000 on your futurity horse, yeah, you're goddamn right. You're showing the futurity on every single thing you can get your hands on, um, whether it's for the best interest of the horse or the best interest of the client becomes secondary. Yeah. And I don't love how much of a focus there is on futurities in my industry, but it is what it is. So I have to do, you know, my best to be fair to my horses and be fair to my clients and get them shown their three and four year old years. Um, but yeah, I see that all the time. And, you know, I, I try to keep good relationships with all the trainers in my area and in my sport. But you do. You see clients who, you know, they get attached to the sport for whatever reason. And then, you know, they go, oh, your horse isn't going to cut it up at this level, you know. And they, to be frank, they weren't going to cut it up at that level, you know. <laughs> and, and, like, you have so much work to do with that client and that horse on the horse that they have before you should ever consider, you know, dropping seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 on a horse yeah. that, you know, yeah, the trainer can show it and the client can attempt to show it, but it, yeah, you see that a lot and it just, it doesn't do anybody any good. And honestly, what I've found is I end up with those clients. So don't do that Yeah. because then they switch, right? Not people aren't that stupid. You can do that for so long before people go, huh? I was doing better on my old horse. It seems like he, he or she is just wanting this horse so they can go show it and win a bunch of money on it, you know? And yeah. you'll see that and these horses get run into the ground and their feet split open and, 
you know, you've got tendon and you've got like tendon damage at like three years old, you know, and you've got horses that are on injections from their four year old year onwards, you know, and that's just common. It's yeah. just, yeah, you know, the vet comes out and you tie up six of them and you say joint test them and stick a needle in whatever you need done. Um, and the vet does, you know, they go, okay, that we injected three stifles and six hawks, you know, and that's, that's a typical day. And, you know, I just, it's hard to do to find that balance where you're like, I need to go show with the futurity and stuff, but I also would like this horse to be somewhat sound when they turn six, you know, it's like that, that's, that's the toughest part. I think for any trainer in this industry is it's kind of hard to be fair to the horses sometimes when, when there's so much pressure on their three-year-old year and you're like, and that makes it tough to, you know, be fair to the clients too, because if your futurity horse goes lame, you need another one. And that's the only way that you're going to be able to showcase yourself um, is, is to have another futurity horse. And so, yeah, you find that a lot that people are just going to get taken advantage of and be like, oh yeah, this is the perfect horse for you. And it's not, it's just a nice enough futurity horse that trainer can show them. So that's awful. Yeah. And that is problematic. Like if the, they're like all of the pressures on like what should just be the intro for the rest of the horses show career. Um, but like, I see the pressure because like trainers also need to make a living. And if that's what all of the clients are demanding, you kind of have to sell out to some degree to yeah. do. Um, and like, I, like I see similar mindsets, like, in, like I've worked with race horses. So like, I think that there's a lot of corruption and like people working horses too hard, but at the same time, like I love the horses and I think the industry has a lot of potential to be great and to clean up and to do stuff that would be better by the horses. I can also help those horses knowing how like I train and how much gentler I'll be on them when I'm riding and like trying to help them carry themselves in a way that would be as damaging to them and like so on and so forth. So there is like a certain level of selling that people tell me I should boycott the whole industry but it's like yeah I could do that but I could also support trainers that I believe in or like practices that I believe in and like eventually if I got my own farm I'd probably want to get some races and I could bring them along in the way that I believe in but to a certain extent like in order to encourage change you have to like first show people that different methods of doing things work and kind of try to be the change you want to see it yeah absolutely this is where I'm gonna interject and do a do a shout out again to another guy that I know you don't like um but this is this is my thing about Clinton Anderson um he came into an industry where it's my industry too where drawing blood off the sides of a horse is everyday practice it's common you know spurring a horse till they bleed popping them in the mouth till they bleed it's not something that really anybody bats an eye about and he was the first, well, not the first, but he came in and basically say what you will about him. That horse of his Titan, it won the NRHA Derby. And he had cameras on the whole time he trained it up under saddle. And you never saw blood coming off of that horse. Sure, he's rougher on that horse than, you know, I may want to be or that people want to be. But I think the reason he became so popular and what I respected about him is he was one of the first people that said look you can train a horse to be that excellent without drawing blood off of them without you know literally beating that horse to a pulp every day mm -hmm. and because of that I have actually seen a change in this industry since that Titan horse ran I think that people are getting less willing to kick them till they bleed and they're getting more willing to, you know, use tight, like, you know, a lot of the stuff that he does is not going to be great for those horses. But the thing that it comes down to in my mind is it's tough to be great to these horses when we have to show them at three years old. Mm -hmm. And that was something for me that he brought this industry that I appreciated and respected from him is he was kind of one of the first to like, show everything that he does and say, yeah, it's not pretty, but I'm not drawing blood off of this horse. And when that is the bar and the bar is quite low, 
you know, he does look good and he has managed, I think, to shift a little bit of the focus in this industry towards getting more groundwork and more fundamental stuff done instead of just jumping on and kicking them. So, like, I would say that's great that he's encouraged some positive change, but I would say that, like, drawing blood only, like, talks about, like, actually, like, causing injury to the skin. So there could be horses that have like, horrendous bruising and soft tissue damage where they've never had blood drawn. And it doesn't mean that the training is better. It just means that the person did not cause injury to, like, the skin to draw blood. Um, and then the other thing that I say about Clinton Anderson being the first is he the first to promote more ethical riding practices or is he the one that got the most attention for it? Because I would say he is set up to get that level of attention and like build his business in the way that he has because he's a straight white man. If you had a woman or a black male rider in this who, who might be more talented and have great ideas, they wouldn't have access to that level of branding and bringing someone up because they wouldn't be the face that your industry would be ready to listen to. So it's not necessarily that he is someone who represents the best in the industry so much as he's the one that they were mo- that was most palatable to market and quick fix methods to. So like I'm I'm glad to hear that he like did like helps with the blood stuff, but like the bar for that is like underwater. It's in the Marion then mm-hmm. Um, so like, I, I'm glad that he brought some positive change, but I think he also brought a lot of like really negative quick fix mentalities because he also normalized the idea that like, if the horse misbehaves, like that, they're just being bad and that you need to teach them to respect you. And he like really branded dominance theory in the horse world. Like I, I call him kind of like the Caesar Milan of the horse world because he's just like a token figure that people offer for quick fix training methods that aren't necessarily the most successful. And honestly, I've seen a lot of wastage and problems come out of the training program where you like well-intentioned and people who will buy his program because it, it, it claims it'll help them fix their young horses that they've purchased without help and have overhorsed themselves. But then they have these dangerous horses that they're disciplining using the incorrect timing on getting really loud and using stressful methods that, horse is more dangerous and more likely to hurt them and I think that there's more of those people out there than ones that have successfully applied his methodology to help their horses and still win ribbons just because he's marketing to those people and it's so easy to yeah well like I said I, I agree with you the bar is underwater you know and I think that it was just the the thing that I liked is he was the first one to show us you know that 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 there is a way to not go below that bar um and and that was that was really all but i totally agree with you that you know he was it, it's right place right time um you know and i i totally understand your perspective on the other stuff yeah i think trainers like you and like warwick schiller and stuff are also less likely to market yourselves in the same way he does because you wouldn't view it as like possible to fix horses as quickly as he claims to probably like a lot of good trainers don't want to promise a client like without even seeing the horse like I can fix this problem in x number of days or within my two-day clinic no problem no questions asked and he's offering those quick fixes which is what has made so popular but a lot of things better don't want to market themselves up yeah no I totally understand that yeah it's hard to put a timeline on what you can do you know and there's the old thing like a lot of trainers around here won't take a horse for 30 days you know they're like no you need to be with me at least 60 days before we're going to be able to do anything close to what you want to do because i need at least 10 days to understand your horse before i can go in and start fixing things you know and that that is something that i think the quick fix fix methods leave out is not every horse is the same people and horses are very similar in that they're different Um, and you can't expect, you know, a horse to always be the same way and always respond to the same cue the same way. And I do think that that's something that a lot of those bigger brands leave out. Yeah. It's, it makes them money though. Like that's the key all is like, if it's profitable, people will do it. Cause like, I'll say like, honestly, since I started talking about more welfare for a while, I'm like, 
plummeted because people were offended and felt targeted. And now they're starting to go up because the industry is starting to change at a more rapid rate. But um, quick fix and like, methods that get horses acting scared and like reacting with bronking and fighting stuff, people like watching that stuff. So it's very yeah. easy. And, yeah. But, yeah, so I, that's my, my last question for you, because we've been an hour and a half, I'm sure you have stuff to do today. So my, my last yeah. question would be, like, um, like uh, outside of TikTok with like my account and some of the other accounts, have you looked into like more of like your training stuff and style of training? Because if not, I have someone I'd love to recommend to check out because she's worked with like um, Grand Prix level jumper with clicker training and taught them some stuff and if you check out her stuff it might give you some cool ideas on how to apply it to raining because you can do it at distance then and yeah sure yeah. um can you repeat the very first part of that again you were kind of cutting out oh sorry have you been to like um like cl any clicker trainers or people who work with horses that do like positive reinforcement like outside of tiktok i mean um like a little bit but not not nearly as much as i could yeah i would recommend like if you want to look up shauna karish like it's also i can send it to you when i send you the link to the imprint study if you want um okay she's done work with like grand prix level show horses for jumping and helped horses overcome like refusals in the show ring clicker training and then the horses have gone back into primarily pressure and release programs and done quite well and she was just down in florida working with some four-star level event riders their horses as well um oh and then someone said here that if you want to look up luke gingrich he's a star plus reigning actually i think i saw that guy he was yeah i've yeah. i've seen i've seen him yeah um he does he does some really cool stuff i've, I've been yeah. watching him recently yeah yeah it's interesting people out there and i also still use pressure and release in my program but it's been very eye-opening just to kind of look how different people can do the same behaviors using like a wildly different methodology yeah and that's the thing for me it's like I think that you know in in the way I train there's obviously a time and place for for everything oh, that cut out for a second oops your audio just cut out mm -hmm. um or mine oh there we go yeah. no. oh sorry somebody called me so, oh no worries um but yeah I just think there's a time and a place for everything and I'm always open to learning new things. And that's, that's the thing that I think this whole industry should take away from our conversation is that, you know, you, sh you should be open to talking to people, even if they're different from you and you should be open to being like, Hey, we have similarities, you know, yeah. and we also have differences and, you know, it's interesting to discuss those and, you know, see, see if you want to change something. So, yeah. No, thank you yeah. so much for doing it. It was really great. And it's so cool to hear like, yeah, all the positive changes that you're bringing to the rating <clears throat> world and stuff. And just to hear some of the bad stuff as well is interesting. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. It was great <laughs> to be on here. Have go a good ride day. my horses. <laughs>